Good morning. We are so glad that you're with us today. And uh, Scott is right. We're going in uh, on the downward slope of uh, the series entitled The Question. And what we've tried to do the last month, at least since Easter, has been respond to questions that people have that can be kind of faith blockers, things that, things that may keep them from taking seriously the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've tried to deal with these questions in an honest way, in, in, a, in a way that it can help you if you're a skeptic and help you kind of weigh your thoughts and maybe think about the gospel in a different light. But then also for those of us who are believers, we come in contact with people all the time who have questions about their faith. And many times we just, we, we don't know what to say. We, we can't respond because we're not sure. And so it's been hopefully beneficial for you as well uh, that we can be able to have those. But we've been dealing with some of these questions. For example, the first one is, how can I believe in Jesus if I don't trust the Bible? And that's a good question. And the question is, I, I would love to believe in Jesus. It sounds great. Grace sounds wonderful. The cross, the resurrection, it all sounds wonderful. I just don't stand, I, I just don't trust the literature that that story is in. And so how can I trust the story? It's a good question. Another question that we had uh, that we dealt with the second time around is if God is so good, why is there hell? If God is so loving and so good, why does it seem, the Bible indicates, a lot of people are going to go to hell away from Jesus. And so if God is so loving, how can I reconcile that? And then the other question that we asked, and this is one that Pastor John dealt with a couple of weeks ago, why is it supposedly, why is a supposedly loving God so bloody? When I read the Old Testament, I see annihilation and, and, and people dying and be, people being butchered. And, and so is the God of the Old Testament different than the God of the New Testament? It's a good question, and John did a great job respond to that question. And then we dealt with last week this question, why won't God answer my questions? I've got questions, and I'd really like to know God's take on my question. And in fact, uh, last Sunday, we, we had these panels uh, across the platform, and we encourage you after the service to come up and just put sticky notes there asking your questions. And this is what we came up with. Um, we had these for staff chapel this last Thursday, and the staff took about five or ten minutes and just went through and read the different questions that people had, and it broke our hearts. <coughs> because people are hurting. And we prayed over these panels, and we just prayed for the people that wrote these things down, and the creative team said, we got to put these things out again because if you, if you want, during the service or after the service, uh, Helen Gavrilov has put some sticky notes and some pens up here. And go ahead and write your question on and, and go ahead and stick those to the panels as well. You are not alone. Whatever question you have, you're not by yourself. Someone else has questions too. And it's not, you're, you're not e expressing a lack of faith by asking God questions. You're displaying faith by asking God's questions because you're placing your trust in the person who has the answer. And so exercise that faith if you want during the service or after the service, just go ahead and do that. The question that we're gonna cover today is one that uh, it, it keeps a lot of people from the faith. Why is it that Christianity and science are always at odds? It seems that way, and I deliberately use the word always. It seems that always they're at odds. There's the Christians over here, and then there's science over here, and, and there's this humongous chasm, this, this wall, this canyon that divides us, and it seems that nothing will be able to bridge that canyon. So why is that? Why is it that science, and because it's, science is such a huge part of our culture, huge part of our culture, what do we do about that? Well, it doesn't help, for example, and we've got Peter like pe people like Peter Atkins, who's an astrophysicist, and he writes this, is it, it is not possible to be intellectually honest and believe in gods. It is not possible to believe in gods and be a true scientist. I read somewhere this week that a Christian who is a scientist by profession, is the loneliest person on the planet. 
And the reason is because in the laboratory, if they're a Christian, they're ridiculed for being a Christian. And if they go to church on Sunday, they're ridiculed for being a scientist. And I hope that's not the case here at RK Church. If, if you are by profession a scientist, if you're a teacher of science, if you're, if you're just an armchair scientist and you've, you've got that muscle you want to exercise, you just love reading about that kind of stuff, I hope that you always feel welcome here regardless of that belief system that you're holding to. But it may be that we would want to challenge that belief system and you know what, maybe you need to challenge us. And that's why we have that question response time at the end of the second service. We'll have that about 12.15 today. And we'd love for you to come and just have a conversation with me. If you have questions, go ahead and tweet those to at Arcade Church. And then you can hashtag my question arcade. And I'll do my very, very best to respond to those things. Now saying that, I've got three really quick things I want to talk, of, talk to you about. Three very, first of all, we're just going to scratch the surface today. All right, so for those of you that really want to go deep, you really want to get into the, into the nuts and bolts of science, that ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen. We're going to scratch the surface of that. Secondly is this, how we communicate with each other is as important or maybe even more important than what we communicate to each other. How we, how we communicate to each other, the attitude of how we care for each other and how we communicate to each other is as important or maybe even more important than what we communicate to each other. And in this day and age of social media, I think that many times we as Christians become the rudest people on the planet, especially when someone posts something that you may not agree with. You just go ballistic verbally, and, and social media has made us very bold people and very cruel people and very unkind people. May not not be us, especially today, because there is this animosity between Christianity and science many times. And so, I think that we need to apply 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, the apostle Peter, he writes this, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Now, how do we do that? How do we, in our hearts, how do we honor Christ the Lord as holy? He gives us a couple of ideas, always being prepared to make a defense Whenever someone comes at us, and when someone disputes with us, or even if someone just inquires about our faith, it's important that we give a viable response. And so if someone comes up to you and says, why are you a Christian? Please do not say, I've always been a Christian. That, that is the dumbest response a Christian could ever give. And that reveals how not thinking you are, because you have not always been a Christian. Or I was raised in church. Well, that tells me where you were raised, but that doesn't tell me why you're a Christian. Why are you a Christian? I think you've got to give a response. Why do you believe this about the Bible? Why do you believe this about Jesus? Why do you believe this about the Trinity? Why do you believe these kinds of things? It's important for you and me to be able to have viable response to those that respond to the question that's been given. And so Peter says the way that you display Christ as holy is by being prepared to defend yourself. And then he gives the other one. To anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. There is a way to dispute with people, to differ with people, and remain gentle and respectful. There's a way to do that. And we're the ones that are supposed to model that. We're the ones that are supposed to live that out, flesh that out, even as people disagree with us. There is a way to say, I think I disagree with you without saying, you're a jerk. There's a way to do that. And we've got to learn how to do that. Hopefully today we'll be involved with that. The third thing I want to say is this. Uh, for those of you who, who've been around, you know this. I'm not a scientist, nor do I play one on TV. I am not a scientist, and so I recognize that many of you in this room are teachers of science, or you are professional science, you're into research, you spend all of your day in a laboratory, and you could talk circles around me on all of the things, all of the points I'm about ready to make. And so my request to you is show some grace, all right? Because to you, I will reveal my ignorance very quickly. And, and, and so just understand that I'm a pastor, 
and I've read a lot, but that doesn't mean I know what you know. I don't know what you know. And so if you could give me some grace, I would really appreciate that. Okay, let's answer the question, or at least respond to it. Why are science and Christianity at odds? Why are they at odds? And there, there's a couple or three reasons. The first one I want to give you right now is, number one, Christians are genuinely viewed as being anti-science. We've talked about that already, but I want to state that. We as conservative Christians, many times, whenever we hear the word science, we go, oh, wow, oh, great. You know that we're into biblical counseling here at Arcade Church, and so we have this reputation, since we're biblical counselors, we're against all of the sciences that go to therapy, to psychiatry. Nothing could be further from the truth. But that's kind of the reputation that we have received, that we are anti-science when it comes to those kinds of things. Because most conservative Christians are creationists. Anything remotely having to do with evolution is just seen as stupid or dumb or inaccurate. And we, and we are very quick to let people know that. And we have developed this relationship or this reputation that displays a lack of respect, that we are anti-science. The, the classic example of this is in the early part of the 17th century, it's something like 1615, something like that, a guy by the name of Galileo, who was a Christian, who was also an astronomer, built a telescope. And he was just curious. He wasn't looking for anything specific. He just wanted to see stuff. And so he looks up in the sky, and he realizes this fact. You know what? The earth revolves around the sun. Up until he discovered that, everyone believed that the sun revolved around the earth. And so he, he, he goes public with his findings, not realizing it would cause such a kerfuffle. And so he's just saying, hey, listen, I just found this out. My new telescope shows that the earth revolves around the sun. The church kicked him out of the church and held him under house arrest for the rest of his life. Because everybody knew, everybody knew, apparently except Galileo, that the sun revolves around the earth. And there are stories like that even, but that's probably the most popular one that we have. But it's such an important one. Science is built upon observable, it's built upon observable patterns and laws. It's built upon the discipline of observing things and noting patterns and laws. And what we as believers say is, yes, we believe that there are patterns and there are laws. Therefore, there is a pattern maker. There is a law maker. If there are laws, if I had a quarter up here and I were to, to drop it before you, what would it do? Well, it would fall to the ground because there is a law called the law of gravity. Now, if I were to do this tomorrow on Monday and come up here at the same time and, 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 and get the same quarter and do the same thing, what's it going to do? It's going to draw because that's a law. It's a pattern. And what Christians are simply saying is, yes, we recognize the law. We recognize the pattern of gravity in this case. So therefore, we believe that because there is a law, there is a pattern, there is a lawgiver, there is a pattern maker. And the person that helps us out with that is none other than C.S. Lewis. Men became, go ahead and put this on the wall there, men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. It's very, very important for us to note that these things... There has not always been this chasm between science and Christianity. Johannes Kepler, he writes this. He was a, a, another 17th century mathematician. He says this, The chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God and revealed to us in the language of mathematics. How many of you really love mathematics? It says the laws of mathematics simply reveal a God of order, a God of patterns for all two of you who love mathematics. <laughs> now, a lot of people will say, well, I mean, Craig, you've just, you've just re referenced Galileo, who was a Christian, C.S. Lewis, who was a Christian, Johannes Kepler. Kepler is a father of modern science and planetary motion, all that kind of stuff. And so even today, he is revered. 
But everybody was a Christian back in the 17th century. Lewis lived in the early part of the 20th, 20th century, but, but everybody was a Christian back in the 17th century. Of course the scientists were Christians. What's interesting is there's a guy by the name of Francis Collins. He uh, is a microbiologist, and he's also involved with the Genome Project. The Genome Project is simply one that examines DNA and discovered DNA. It's a very powerful thing. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But when he became a scientist, he was an avowed and very verbal and aggressive atheist. And through the readings of C.S. Lewis, books like Mere Christianity, things like that, he became a lover of Jesus Christ. And this is what he writes. The God of the Bible is also the God of the genome. He can be worshipped in the cathedral or the laboratory. He found this. I can go on Sundays with my congregation and sing great songs and open my Bible and pray with the saints and enjoy that, and God is worshipped. But I find on Mondays I can go to my, labor, uh, my, my laboratory and I see the intricacies of the genome project and DNA and all of the complexity of this, and I'm overwhelmed by this. I find myself worshiping the creator of that as well. It doesn't have to be a fight. It doesn't have to be a separation between science and Christianity. It doesn't have to be at all. In fact, there are many, many Christian scientists, not the denomination Christian scientists, but many, many scientists who are Christians. Many more today, growing in number simply because of what they're finding out. So number one, there has been this anti-science knowledge or this view going around within the church. But then number two, science is the only reliable source of knowledge. Science is the only reliable source of knowledge. For those of you of high school education, college education, you remember probably the scientific method. It begins with observation, then it moves to theory, hypothesis, to testing, to observation, and then more testing and observation, more testing and hypothesis, and that's just the scientific method. And what is very, very popular today is the idea that there is nothing worth knowing out there unless it can be derived through that process. There is no other truth out there except what you can test through observation, theory, hypothesis, testing. That's the only way that you can come to the kind of truth that you have to have. Peter Atkins, again, he says this, there is no reason to believe that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. With every aspect of this, there is no reason to believe that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. But now you can begin to see the problem with that, right? Because yes, there is scientific truth. There are things that we can only know by observation, testing, hypothesis. But there are other things that we can learn as well through a moral aspect, a moral lens, a spiritual lens an impressionist lens. For example, you walk into a house and through the door into the kitchen and on the stove is water boiling in a tea kettle. And you ask the question, why is that water boiling? And someone there says, well, because gases are being released, it's heating the water to 212 degrees Fahrenheit, sea level, and that's why the water is boiling. The other person in the kitchen is just saying, I just wanted a cup of tea. <laughs> now, are, is either one of those wrong? No, they're, they're both right. One can be found, one truth can be found through observation, through testing, through patterns, through laws, but the other one is just simply through desire, through hope. And I think it's very important that we understand that. John Ortberg has helped me with this. He's got a very good quote. Science involves method that is enormously useful to investigate large chunks of reality. But it is not the only way to know truth. Human life is of great value. That's true. You know that, but you can't put it in a test tube. It is wrong to live for selfish greed. That's true. That is moral truth. A society that is unable to acknowledge 
the existence of moral truth is headed for serious problems. So my response to Peter Atkins, who says, nothing worth knowing can ever come worth knowing unless it's through the scientific method, I says, then, then from a societal standpoint, we've got spiritual truth, we've got moral truth. There are certain laws in play that are true in any culture. Well, how do we measure those scientifically? Well, there's no test tube. There's no way that we can be able to do that. I want to I show you some, some pictures here of some beautiful scenery. And just take, take uh, if, Kim, if you could leave them up a little longer, and that way we can be able to take them in. Isn't that beautiful? That's a sunset, I'm assuming, on the West Coast. Wouldn't be on the East Coast, I guess. Um, uh, and by the way, Beth found these pictures, and they have not been doctored. That's how they are. And would, would that not be incredible? Go to, go to the next one. This beautiful, beautiful lavender purple flower. This, this is Debbie's favorite color, and this is a beautiful flower. Look at, look at the pollen. Look at the details of that. Look at how rich and how beautiful and intricate each of those things are, those petals, whatever they are. I don't know what they are. Um, next one. Grand Canyon. Isn't that incredible? That is so beautiful. That's awe-inspiring. There's one more, I think. Yeah, yeah, Redwood Forest. We try to find pictures that we've seen before, that we've been to before. But look at these trees. They're hundreds, if not thousands of years old, and they're standing strong even today in this beautiful mist. It's just incredible. Go ahead and just, even on, on both screens, if you can, Kim, leave me off the screen. And just, just cycle through these. There is a way to explain every one of these pictures scientifically. A, a, science, a scientist can look at this and say, well, the reason why it's yellow and the reason why the waves are this way and the reason why the sun is beating down and it looks like you can almost walk to the sun on the water, the reason why it's in these clouds, these, the, why the sky is blue, there's a scientific reason for all of those things. The same with the other picture. Go ahead. This one, there's a scientific, there's a scientific reason why these things have these ridges and why the pollen is yellow and these petals are a different shade of purple or lavender. There's there's a scientific, and they could give you all the scientific reasons for that. What's the next one? Oh, there, there's a scientific reason why this canyon is here. There's a river at the bottom of this canyon that has taken billions, perhaps, of years to cut through this canyon, and that's why this, they can go to all the science about this, and the same with the redwood forest. There's a reason why these trees are so huge and so powerful. There's a scientific reason for all this, but they can't answer the question of wow. There's no, there's no test tube for that. There's no way to be able to get through with this and, and, and get, get past the wonder of what we have just seen. And when you begin to wonder, even if you're not a Christian here today, wonder is not far from worship. When you begin to see the beauty of these pictures and the beauty of these scenery, or, and you've seen some of these with the naked eye, you've been there, you've looked that close at a flower, you've seen that. And some of us had this bent, I wonder what colors, what pigments happened there, what's going on there, photosynthesis, all that kind of stuff, what's happening there? Other of, other of us are going, just going, dude, that's just amazing. And you can't test that. That's why in the Bible, in Psalm 19, we've got this passage. We're going to look at some scripture here a little bit. In Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. When I'm looking out, and I look, and I just see this, and I see the beauty of what's going on. And I'm just looking and I'm thinking. I'm learning things about the one who's responsible for this. I'm learning things about that creator. Yes, there's a, a scientific reason why the Grand Canyon's there. Yes, there's a scientific reason why that flower is so beautiful. Yes, there's a scientific reason why the sunset looks so bright and so vivid. There's a scientific reason for all those things. But all of a sudden, you begin to go beyond that and you see something else. For example, another passage coming up is Psalm chapter 8. In Psalm chapter 8, we see this. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. 
What is man that you are mindful? I'm looking at this. I'm looking at all the beauty of the expanse of the solar system, and all of a sudden I can't help but think of me. How small I am. How insignificant I am. And the son of man that you would care. I, all of this stuff that you care about and you care for me. He goes on. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. I am so insignificant when I see the expanse of what you have done. And yet what you have done is you, you have crowned me with honor. You have, you have established a relationship with me. He goes on. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. Now he gets horizontal. He's looking around down here. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. And here's his conclusion. Let's read it together. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You can't measure that scientifically. You can just look and you can see and there are people who have a bent that as they're looking, they want to get into the details and, and the what's and the how's and oh, I, I, I thank God for them. But there are those moments when we see the beauty of expanse and then also the things around us and all we can do is just say, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name? I live in a culture that says, oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is my name. But God, when I see everything that you've created, my wonder turns into worship. My wonder turns, hey, you can't put that in a laboratory. You can't put that in a test tube. You can't, you can't put that under a, a microscope. And you can't see it with a telescope. We have a, a third reason why uh, Christianity and science don't seem to play well in the same schoolyard. And this is probably the obvious one. This is the granddaddy of them all. Evolution has disproved Genesis. And that's what we're told in our universities. What's amazing to me is many Christian universities are now established in this position as well. So therefore, I would probably not call them Christian. That may be, you, you may have invited someone to come to this series, and the reason why they are not here today is because of this. this I, I, I'm good with a historical Jesus. I'm good believing that Jesus died on the cross. It's just when you Christians go to creation, I just think that's the dumbest thing ever. Because there's so much evidence that points towards evolution. And then that's when we Christians start digging our heels and say, oh, yeah? Well, ch check this evidence out and check this evidence out and check this evidence and go to this website and go to this website. And you can see it all played out on Facebook. And then pretty soon no one's going to be convinced. I've got this quote from a guy at Cornell University named William Provine, and this is what he says. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, I am absolutely certain that I am going to be dead. There is no ultimate foundation for, life, for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. I've read this a dozen times this week, and every time I walk away thinking, I wonder how he is at parties. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to hang out with him. My son went to that school, and I'm not sure my son had him as a professor, but I hope not. All kinds of people out there believe that. That creation is a faulty system and that we Christians then we get defensive we get very rigid we get unmoving and all of a sudden we lose the ability to have a conversation 
And here's what I want to say, and, and this is going to probably make everybody in this room mad at different times. I believe by conviction that science will never, science will never disprove the Bible. Never. Science will never disprove the Bible, but science may disprove how I read the Bible. Science may disprove my conclusion, my interpretation of the Bible. I mentioned to you Galileo in 1615, kicked out of the church because he said, I see that the earth revolves around the sun. The church says, nah, uh the sun revolves around the earth. And here's why. You want to know why the church believed that? Bible. Because the Bible said it. Here's the passage, Psalm 93. Psalm 93 says this, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has, whoa, we there? The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. See there, Galileo? The earth is established. It shall never, it says it right there in print. The Bible, the Bible says the earth is stationary. It shall not be moved. Everything else revolves around that. Turn now, Galileo, to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Check out this, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. You're saying the earth revolves around the sun, then why does the sun move? And the, and the church was rock solid on their position. This is the way the Bible reads. Now we sit there and even some of you are chuckling because you know that science has moved beyond that. Why? Because, why? I think you're wrong because the Bible says the, the earth shall not be moved. The, the Bible says the sun rises and the sun goes down. Clearly you don't believe the Bible. Well, of course we believe the Bible. And that is where we understand that the Bible is a library of books that has different genres to it. For example, we're quoting Psalms and Ecclesiastes. What genre is Psalms and Ecclesiastes class? Poetry. It's poetry. And so you read it like poetry. You don't read Psalms or Ecclesiastes like you read Revelation, which is apocalyptic. You don't read apocalyptic literature. You don't read Revelation like you read Matthew. You don't read a John Grisham novel the same way that you read Shakespeare. Nobody reads Shakespeare, but you don't do it. But, but, but you don't, you read them differently. You've got a Maya Angelou poem, you don't read that like Computer for Dummies manual. You recognize the genre in which that was written and you interpret it that way. And so if the church was here at this time and we know what we now know, along with Galileo, we would say to the church, listen, we get, we get that the sun rises and the sun goes down. We get that because the writer of Ecclesiastes is writing about what they observe. They're not giving you scientific truth. They're writing, even the weatherman on Channel 3 says the sunrise tomorrow will be. Now, if you're in a room and, and, and you say, what time is the sunrise? And someone says, actually, the sun doesn't rise. That's when you say, shut up. <laughs> you know exactly what I mean. The Bible has to be interpreted according to the genre. Now, here's the issue. There are a lot of people, probably in this room, that read Genesis 1 through 3 as history. It's the account of God using six literal 24-hour days to speak creation into existence and resting on the seventh day. And so when you look at the evidence of that, if that is true, then you look and when people say the earth isn't billions of years old, it's actually a very young earth, it's 6,000 to 10,000 years old, you're saying, yeah, it's about right. It's about right. We're good with that. You hear about carbon dating. You hear about geological dating. And, and you hear that it's unreliable, and it is. Then you, you take that as saying they're wrong because it's unreliable. They're wrong. But what you have to understand, please understand this. 
and we can talk about this in the question response time if you want, that there are people who are just as committed as you are to the faith in Jesus Christ. They believe the Bible as much as you do, but they don't look at Genesis 1 through 3 as history. They look at it as poetry. Two reasons why. Number one, people back then, the time when Moses wrote these words down, they were not asking the questions of when and how. We asked those questions. They were not asking questions of when and how. They were asking the questions who and why. They were wandering in the wilderness, probably when Moses wrote these words down, and they were surrounded by all kinds of nations who worshiped multiple gods, and every one of those cultures had a creation story. And so it stands to reason that the people of God are saying, what's our story? What's the story of this God that has delivered us from Egypt? What is the story of this mighty God, this pillar of fire at night, this pillar of cloud in the day? What is the story of this God that parted the Red Sea and destroyed all of Pharaoh's armies? What is that story, and why are we part of it? In other words, Moses, when he wrote Genesis, was answering the question, who and why? Who got us here, and why are we here? And there are many, many faithful believers, and they will read it, and they will say, that's poetry, because Moses is not answering the when and how question. He's answering the who and why question. Secondly, for those who are historical, they would say, why, if it's historical days, why is not the sun created until the fourth day? If there is morning and evening when the other days, why is the sun not created? And they would, that, that's a blocker for me to believe that it's historical. I believe, it, I believe it's true. I believe that God created us. I believe he created us for his glory. And as, as image bearers, I believe all of that. I just have a hard time believing it's six literal days. And so when a scientist comes along and says, the earth has been here for billions of years, they say, I, okay, I'm good with that. It's not a big deal. It's not a problem. When they hear about carbon dating and geological dating and how unreliable that is, they say, yeah, I know it's unreliable, but it could be true could be true. Now, the reason why I mention that is not to create, believe it, trust me, I am not trying to create tension. I'm trying to say, listen, I think that we're closer than we really think we are when it comes to creation and evolution. Those who believe that Genesis 1 through 3 is poetry, they don't believe necessarily that we ascended from apes or from an amoeba. There's no geological, biological proof of that. When scientists tell us that, that we have a very, very similar, similar code, a DNA code with the ape, the evolution would say, see, that's why we've come from the apes. And, and we as Christians simply say, well, that just shows us that there's consistency with the creator. I, I, I think that we have to open the lines of communication when it comes to the differing of how we read things. Now, if you want to come to the Q&R time at, after that, we can do that and, and take a look at some of these things. A second, or, or uh, that, those are the three, uh, some points of compatibility between Christianity and science that I think are really important here. The first one is the Big Bang. The Big Bang, not the TV show, but the actual theory itself, the Big Bang. Somewhere eons of time ago, there was matter, and then it exploded, and this, that's how we got here. And there's all kinds of theories as far as that is concerned. But what's interesting is that, that Francis Collins I told you about, he, he headed up the Genome Project. This is what he writes about. He, he is a scientist, a very well-respected scientist in the field. And this is what he writes about that. The existence of the Big Bang begs the question of what came before that and who or what was responsible. It certainly demonstrates the limits of science as no other phenomena has done. The, in other words, he's saying the Big Bang, that's not a bad theory. This is Francis Collins. Okay, we get, because everything seems to be moving away in a pattern. There's a pattern to things moving away. When Before that was found out, the Big Bang was things just exploding, and they're moving away. But now we're seeing they're moving away consistently in a pattern. There's a design to that. If it was just this random explosion, there would be no design to it. And Francis Collins saying, that's pretty cool. 
He says this, the sense of awe created by these realizations has caused more than a few agnostic scientists to sound downright theological. There's this movement towards the fact that there is this intelligent designer to the point where even non-believers who look at this Bible and say, you gotta be kidding me, are simply saying now, I, there is too much evidence to point to order and design and pattern and laws, and that means that there is a designer. That means there is a pattern maker. That means there's a lawmaker and lawgiver. I can't ignore the reality of those things. A second thing that might be moving us closer is fine-tuning. Back in the 60s, um, Time magazine ran uh, the, on the cover, God is Dead. And one of the reasons why God is dead was because the scientist Carl Sagan was really getting his foothold in popularity and popular uh, culture. And, and one of the things that Carl Sagan said, he said, I, uh, for life to exist on another planet only requires two components to be true at the time. For life to exist somewhere else in our universe it only requires two conditions. Number one, a star like ours, like the sun. And number two, a planet with equal distance from that star, like ours, 93 million miles. And his conclusion was, because of the quintillion, bazillion, gargantuan number of stars in the universe, the odds of a condition of a planet meeting those conditions are incredible. There is life out there. The space project, Gene Roddenberry, George Lucas, they began to fantasize about life out there. And all of a sudden, science fiction took hold. And, and we were sending out radio waves out into the outer space, messages from our presidents and notes about our intelligent society and all those kinds of things. We were sending messages out. And people were excited because there's life out there because there are only two conditions that need to be met. But through the space program, through Hubble telescope, through other scientific means of which I don't get, maybe you do, all of a sudden they begin to find out, yeah, there's not two conditions, there's 10. Year or two later, you know what we found out? There aren't 10 conditions, there's 20, 50, 60. To this day, right now, there are 200 things that need to be met perfectly in order for life to be sustained. And now scientists are backing off and very quietly saying, the percentage percentage of chance that life exists on another planet is zero. In fact, a couple of scientists will simply say this, I don't even know how we're here. The probability, we shouldn't be here either, and yet here we are existing, and not only existing, we're talking about existing. Fine-tuning. Complexity. Complexity. Uh, Back in 1972, Roe v. Wade, the the, uh, Supreme Court, they ruled in the legalization of abortion. And science at that time had not caught up with the ruling, which tells a little bit about our society anyway. But they were saying, listen, Christians, we know you're upset. We know you're ticked because all these babies are going to be dying. We're just in. The science is going to show they're not babies. That zygote, that fertilized egg, that fetus is just tissue. It's not a human being. And so the science, just be patient. Don't get too mad. Be patient because the science will show, the science will show that it's just, it's not really a human being. Well, as the years have progressed, scientists have gotten fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer. And now, no longer, when you talk about pro-life, pro-choice issues, science is never brought up by the pro-choice community. Because science has switched sides. I mentioned to you Francis Collins, the Genomes uh, Project and DNA. I I did a little bit of read on DNA because I just don't understand it. And DNA, it's, it, it's code, much like we have computer code. It's ones and zeros. And every single person has a different DNA. And for those of you who are gamers, think about how many characters, how many ones and zeros go into a game of some type. 
You're playing a game on your video, and think about the ones and zeros that go into it. It's probably in the millions, maybe the tens of millions. What science have discovered in one cell, in one human cell, are three billion characters. Not in one human being, in one cell of one human being are three billion characters to the point now where all of a sudden that little fertilized egg, that zygote, that fetus that's growing inside the mother's womb, no longer can they say that that's just tissue. That is a human being with DNA code, billions and billions of characters. Now those of you who are gamers, do you think it's reasonable to think that someone in, in Silicon Valley just sat down and said, okay, they sat down at their keyboard, I'm going to make a game. <laughs> and they just start typing. They just start typing characters. And they start typing code. They're just typing. They're not even paying attention to what they're doing on the keyboard. This is a keyboard, by the way. Keyboard. They're not, they're not even paying attention to that. Is it reasonable to think that by chance a video game came out of that? No, in a video game, there is such intense complexity, I don't get it. And yet in one human cell, there are three billion zeros and ones. Three billion. All designed, all unique from anyone else. That should cause us to say, I can worship God at Arcade Church on Sunday mornings, and I can worship God in the laboratory. I can worship God where the test tubes and the beakers are. I can worship God where I'm taking water out of the American River to test it. I can worship God everywhere because I see his design. I see his power. I see his laws everywhere, and I can worship him. I love what Robert Jastrow, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, has said. At this moment, it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled, and get the imagery here, he has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. And I don't, I don't mean to, I don't, I don't put that here to insult those who have a bent towards the science, scientific method. I mention that because these two things are so compatible. And my heart goes out to those young people. Our son was one of them. They're raised in a public school system and they're, they're raised in, in a local church and they go off to a university and all of a sudden they find out that what, how the church has represented the scientific movement is anything but true. They have been taught improperly in the church. And what has happened is what they thought was an enemy, they now see as a friend, and they don't know what to do with that. They don't need to, they don't, I, I was taught to despise science. I was taught to smirk at it. I was taught to not respect it. I was taught to reject whatever they find. But now I'm at university. I see now what they find, and, and what they find is good. It's been observed. It's, there's been a hypothesis. There's been a theory. It's been tested and observed again. But I was told that they're wrong. And well, no wonder they leave the faith. It's, uh, if you're a scientist, if you're an aspiring to be a scientist, you know what Jesus would tell you? I think. I, I'm, I'm really speculating here. All right. This is a long shot. I think what Jesus would tell you is go for it. Go for the truth. Go, go for that truth and seek that truth and examine and observe. Because you, as a Christian who is a scientist, you should be the happiest 
person on the planet because you can look at things and you can examine them and test them and observe them and come away and then you get a chance to tell other people like me and like you what you have found and then on top of that, you know who to thank. You know who to praise. You know who to glorify. You know who to honor. So I, I hope... I hope that if you are a professional scientist or you teach science, man, teach it well, observe, go after it, pursue that truth, take it wherever it will take you. And then worship. Worship him as you go through that time. Because here's another thing that science can't do. Go ahead and put the other image up there, Kim. Let's say that, I'm making you hungry, isn't it? You don't get any of it. Let's say that someone, a friend, brings this over to you, brings it to your house. Say, we'd like to have this cherry pie. And you take it, it says, thank you. And then you take it to Sac State Laboratory and say, could you examine this? I want to do that with some food we've been given. <laughs> and you say, could you, could you just examine this, please? And they're sure, and so they can examine it. They could, they could discover the variety of cherry they can, they can come up with how much sugar is in it. Where did the red dye come from? They could talk about the flour. They could probably even talk about the pan that, or the, the dish. Is that a dish? Is that a dish? Dish? And, and, and they could talk about how, how, how hot the oven was. They, could, they can come away and answer all kinds of questions about the pie. But they'll never be able to answer this question. Why did your friend bring it? And your friend says, I, I brought it because I love you. I brought it because I think you need encouragement. I brought it because I hate cherry pie and I thought you'd like it. <laughs> Science will never be able to answer the why. So when we go on this is vacation season, when you go on vacation and you see wonderful things all around you, and you go out away from the city lights and you see the stars and you see the cloud formations, you see sunrises and sunsets. Yes, I know, they don't rise and fall. But you see all of those things. All kinds of people can go, this is why that cloud is that way and this is that constellation there and this is why you can see that planet and this is why that fish swims over there and this is why that tree grows like this and this is why that flower is orange. They can do all of that, but they'll never be able to answer the why. And the why is you are loved. You are treasured. You are precious. And the why goes even further because the why came to us. He came and he lived among us and we can get into the logistics of, of just how he was crucified and, and what kind of wine did he make? Was it grape juice? Was it wine? We, we can go into where, where did he go? What city? Did, we can get into the scientific aspects of the life of Jesus. We can even get into the details of the crucifixion. We can do all those kind of things but what it comes down to is why did he do it? And the why is because he loves you. The why is because he cares for you. The why is because he would rather die for you than exist without you. And that's what science can't do. Science can be such a blessing to us, and I hope it will be continually, but it will never be able to answer the why. It's just that the more we know of science, the deeper the why goes. God, why did you make that flower purple? I love you. Why did you make the, can the Grand Canyon so deep and so magnificent? Because I love you. Why did you make those redwoods so tall? I love you. Why did you give us that sunset? I love you. That's why. Let's stand together. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We glory in what you've given us. We glory in what you've done for us. Father, I pray specifically for those scientists in this room. Either they are or they aspire to be. I pray, Lord God, that you will give them a fellowship here where they, 
they can enjoy their discipline and not face the constant ridicule that we Christians can sometimes level. Make us gentle, make us kind. Thanks for listening to the Arcade Church Podcast. Visit us at arcadechurchonline.com, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Thank you.